everybody. Welcome back to the Dr. Jockers Functional Nutrition Podcast. And I have got my friend, uh, fantastic chiropractor, Dr. Audrey Bedford. Dr. Audrey owns and operates Exodus Health Center, which is my former clinic. And I handed it off to her. And she has taken fantastic care of all my former clients and uh, lots of people. And she really is a specialist in working with um, pregnant women and children. So she has gone through specialty training on that and continuing education that, that she's constantly going to. In fact, she's in Florida right now as we do this interview uh, at going to a conference this weekend to learn more skills on how to take great care of pregnant women and children. She obviously takes care of a wide variety of different people. Uh, her husband is actually an athlete, so she's worked with athletes as well. But she really has a passion for children, children's health, and also for, for pregnant women. In fact, she's a doula, so she helps with, um, with delivery as well um, and home births. And so, Dr. Audrey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, you know, you are a wealth of knowledge, and obviously you're, you're a specialist when it comes to working with pregnant and uh, pregnant women and children, but I'd like to know your story and really how you got involved with chiropractic. Um, so believe it or not, I was actually headed to med school in undergrad and probably about my junior year of undergrad, I met a life recruiter, um, Life University of Marietta, and he was talking about chiropractic and how, you know, the body heals itself and it, you know, it needs no help, just no interference. And that really rang out to me because I've never been big into medicine um, I knew I wanted to work with people. I knew I wanted to do something in the health field. I just didn't know where. And so I went to visit Life and fell in love with the campus. It's absolutely beautiful. If you haven't, if you haven't been, you definitely have to visit. Um, but yeah, so um, the summer before I started chiropractic school, I got into a car accident. It's a pretty bad car accident. Um, and of course, the first thing I went to the hospital and they gave me muscle relaxants and pain relievers. And I went home and I was taking them, but I was in so much pain, so much agony. And um, someone told me to go see a chiropractor. And I went to the chiropractor and the first thing he told me was, so I'm gonna need you to get off the med, the pain meds so that I know if I'm actually helping you. And for me, like that like was mind blowing. Cause I'm like, I'm in pain, I'm supposed to be taking pain meds. And he's like, no, he's like, chiropractic can really help. Like, just give me a chance. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. So I stopped taking the pain meds and seriously, within a few days, the pain started to, to go away. I started to feel more clear, uh, more than I had been prior to the car accident. I've been, I've been in quite a few car accidents. I had a rough start, um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that was the best that I had felt so quickly after a car accident. And so that was my first experience with a chiropractor. And so I'm like, okay, well, this stuff kind of actually works. And then, of course, I get into chiropractic school and I start learning about how the body is just made. It's amazing. Um, the body's made to heal and it's made to adapt. And to be a part of that is is what I want. That that was my passion. And that's what I strive for now. And so, yeah, so that's how I got into chiropractic. Yeah, it's such a great story. And, uh, you know, I have somewhat of a similar story in the sense that I fell in love with the philosophy. I really didn't know much about chiropractic, but I love the philosophy that our body could heal itself. It's so empowering. And so when I, when I heard about that and I read a book on chiropractic, I was like, that's what I want to do is be a doctor that empowers people and teaches them that the power within our bodies can actually heal and regenerate us. And, you know, that, that that's the greatest power in the world is the power God put within us to heal. And so let's talk about, because a lot of people are confused about chiropractic. So we're talking a little bit about the philosophy. Um, how does chiropractic work? Like, how does it work on a physiological level? So chiropractic is a so drugless surgery, uh, surgery free profession um, that really focuses on, like you said, helping the body to reach its optimal potential. Um, so we're not treating, we're not healing anything. The body does the healing. All we do is remove the interference. So whether that interference be uh, physical interference from a misalignment in the spine or from toxins or traumas or, or stresses that's being put on the body, our job is to remove that interference so that the body can do the healing. Uh, we do look to the spine. Obviously, the brain controls everything that happens in the body. Um, and so making sure that the brain, which is encased in bone, and the spinal cord, which is encased in bone, is in the proper positioning so that there's no interference from brain to body and body to brain. 
Um, and that's basically the gist of what we do. It looks a little different depending on who you're working on. So obviously a chiropractic adjustment for a newborn baby is going to be very different from a chiropractic adjustment from an adult, but the premise is the same. And that's just to remove the interference and allow God to do the healing. Yeah, for sure. And I, I used to use this description for patients. I used to say, it's kind of like a radio station and you're trying to tune your radio station and you get a whole lot of feedback, right? And so it's just a lot of scatter. And that's what happens when the spine is out of alignment. And when there's pressure on the nerves and on the central nervous system, it's like scatter. So you can still function, but you know, your communication patterns are off. And then the adjustment helps to tune that radio station to where that communication pattern is more effective. So that way the whole body works, works a lot better, functions a lot better. And you yeah. feel it, you, you, you notice it and you experience it. And that's kind of what you were talking about after that car accident. Absolutely. So let's talk about pregnancy and some of the challenges that women go through during pregnancy and how chiropractic can really help them. So many times when pregnant women are coming to the chiropractor, especially if they've never been to a chiropractor, they're coming because they're having issues like sciatica. Um, they may be having issues with acid reflux, um, headaches, back pain, um, leg pain. And a general chiropractor can address most of these issues. Um, the difference in, I guess, so I'll kind of veer over into Webster. So Webster trained chiropractors, we focus a little more on the pelvis and aligning the ligaments and the muscles of the pelvis so that not only does mom feel and heal better, but also that uterus that's growing that baby, the body that's growing that baby is also going to function better, um, which is obviously going to be better overall for not only the pregnancy, but also birth and postpartum and beyond. Um, and so, yeah, so with pregnancy, we're really focusing on how can we optimize this body um, so that mom and baby heal better. Uh, we're not working on baby, so we're not doing, um, you know, in utero work, but what we do to mom affects how the baby develops and functions. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know when my wife was, when we were pregnant with the twins, um, you know, that, that was, that was her first pregnancy and that was just so challenging on our body. Oh, yeah. And, you know, thank God, like I'm not a specialist when it comes to pregnancy that, you know, I was, I practiced chiropractic for over a decade, but that wasn't my specialty. I adjusted pregnant women, but, um, you know, I wasn't trained in Webster technique like you are. And there's this really specific training mm -hmm. that goes on with that. But fortunately she was able to get care with a Webster trained doctor. Um, that was before you were at, you were part of my clinic. And uh, it helped so much. It really uh, helped her out a lot when it came to back pain because as she was growing, of course, she had two babies inside of her. So she had all this front weight and things had to shift and adjust. Okay. And it made it so much more comfortable, uh, you know, as far as carrying the babies and, uh, and being able to do the things that she needed to do. So it was huge. And then, of course, also with our, our youngest, but joyful, um, you know, not quite as much of a load as the twins on her, but still it was extremely helpful. And, you know, we were able to have a couple of really great, great, healthy births with it. And then also helping her recover afterwards, too, is really big. Yeah. Yep. And then, you know, let's talk about children, because a lot of people don't realize you know, the, how the birth process can actually impact the health of, of the child. They don't really think about it. And most people, when they think about chiropractic, they think about back pain, neck pain, car accidents. So they don't think that children can benefit from this, but how can they? Absolutely. So from that first newborn checkup, what we're doing, so same thing is we're moving the interference. Uh, when babies are born, when they come down the birth canal, they're being squeezed and twisted out of the birth canal. And sometimes if you're, you know, in a hospital birth or a more hands-on birth, the baby can be pulled out of the other end. And so they may end up with issues at the very top of their spine from day one. And of course, babies can't tell you my neck hurts, my back hurts. But what they do tell you is, okay, I can't turn one way or the other. I'm not latching on both breasts normally, or um, they may have reflux issues um, so, or just, you know, range of motion issues that we see in newborns. And so it's correcting these imbalances early on so they, they don't turn into bigger issues. Um, you got to think that babies, everything that they learn early on is from what they see, what they touch, what, they're, what their environment is giving them. So if they can only um, experience one half of their environment, then that's a whole realm of things that they're not getting. Um, so making sure that range of motion, making sure that there are no misalignments, no, no tension in the spine. They should be absolutely parasympathetic. So rest and digest, um, eat, sleep, and poop. If they're not doing those three things, then mm. there's something wrong. 
Um, so just making sure that they're functioning well from day one so that we don't have major issues as we get older. Yeah, it's really important, especially as, as babies and children are developing, their immune system is really growing. Your, your immune system is like a muscle. It needs to be challenged in order to grow and get stronger. And a baby's immune system and a young child's immune system is not as strong or, you know, early on, it's, it's still learning and growing. Right. Um, and so it, it takes on a lot of challenges and a lot of children, you know, they get frequent colds and, and fevers and different things like that. A lot of children end up with ear infections. And some of this is normal. You know, it's normal again to have that challenge and allow the body to, to have to build immune resiliency. Where does chiropractic come in and how can that help the child build a stronger immune system? So being able to adapt and heal is a part, like you said, a part of the immune system. So 80% of our immune system lies in our gut and lies in our body. Mm -hmm. So making sure that there's no interference from the, you know, the breast milk that baby's getting, can they incorporate it into their, into their body? Can they build this natural immune system so that when they, uh, when they come against, you know, bacteria and viruses that we always, that we all do, um, that there's no, there's no issue in there so that they're healing, they're adapting as they get older, as they grow. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, coming out of that birth canal, like you were saying, can be really traumatic on, on the baby's spine. And oftentimes there's injury there. And when there's some sort of injury, particularly in like the upper, upper neck region, that's going to put the baby in a, a state of fight or flight. Right. So oftentimes they're not going to sleep as well. Um, they may have more issues with constipation because it's going to affect the gut like you were talking about. They may not feed well. And that's also going to impact the way that their immune system responds. They're going to be much more prone to having issues where they're not able to, um, you know, fend off colds and fevers and, and things like that as effectively as right. another child who, who doesn't have that level of injury in their neck or interference in their nervous system. And, you know, on top of that, they can be much more likely to develop allergies, and asthma, and different breathing problems and immune type, of, type problems as they develop. Mm -hmm. So like you were talking about, really making sure that there's no interference there can play a huge role in their overall health. Now, let's shift a little bit to nutrition, because I know you also do nutrition with pregnant moms and with, with children. So what are some key areas that you look at? Um, as women, let's say, let's, let's even go before that. Let's, let's go prenatal before they're, you know, cause that's really where we need to start. Let's say they want to get pregnant yes. and they want to have a healthy baby. What do they need to start looking at with their nutrition? Yes. So you are absolutely right. So preconception is extremely important when we start talking about, you know, you want to try for baby. It's not, and it's not just mom, but it's also dad. So making sure that you're mm -hmm. eating a good balanced diet, that's full of good and healthy fats um, good, clean protein, um, lots of fruits and vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. And then for some people who, who, who do well with them, some carbs, some carbohydrates. Um, so making sure that you're giving your body what it needs um, throughout the cycles prior to you getting pregnant is actually very important um, because, you know, you're building, so you build your follicles before there's ever an, a fertilized egg placed into them. Um, and so making sure that your body has everything that it needs, that egg, that, that early fetus has everything that it needs is super important. Um, one, that one book that I really like to reference for pregnancy is called Real Foods for Pregnancy, and it's by Lily Nichols. And she's a dietitian, but she's also a researcher. And so she, her book is very, um, very opposite mainstream pregnancy nutrition um, recommendations. Because in normal times, what they typically will tell you is, you know, you need more fortified grains, more fortified carbs, um, less fat. They tell you, um, you know, be weary of the types of meats and fish and things that you eat and she goes completely against that because what we typically need to do is get back to our primitive ways of eating so if you look at ancestral ways of eating they ate you know the whole animal so they mm -hmm. ate full fats they ate you know they got plenty of collagen they got plenty of you know the calcium and things in the in the bones of the animals they ate fish they had there were no restrictions on fish and they didn't eat fortified grains they were eating um you know good um whole carbs whole carbs full of fiber um to help supplement that body and so definitely so it goes back to the same thing so you want to make sure that you know when you're consuming um 
animal products that you want to get the cleanest ones. So pastured meat, you want to have grass fed meat. Mm. Um, if you're eating, you know, eggs and things like that, you want to make sure that they're, you know, no antibiotics, no hormones, as clean as possible and as close to the source as possible. That's really important. Um, one thing that she dispels that I really like is, is the fish. So a lot of times we are told, you know, you shouldn't have fish in, in your pregnancy because of the mercury. Mm -hmm. But what they never address is selenium. So selenium helps to bind up the mercury so that it doesn't affect the body the same way. And so having omega-3s, having um, the full fats that come from fish is very important. Um, and eating fish with bones. So I'm not a big fan of sardines, but <laughs> sardines, you get the whole fish with the bone. So you're getting, um, you're getting that collagen, you're getting the calcium that's in the bone and not being afraid or not restricting yourself through, through pregnancy. Um, I'll also say a lot of people ask about vegetarians. So can you be a vegetarian while pregnant? And the answer is yes, but <laughs> there are some things that you need to make sure that you're incorporating into your diet. Um, so dairy and eggs. So even if you just went, you know, they call it ovo lacto. So you're eating mm -hmm. eggs, you're eating full fat dairy. Yeah. Those things are going to be really, really beneficial because it's going to give you the folate. It's going to give you the choline. It's going to give you those B vitamins, especially B12. Mm -hmm. um, that your body needs in order to build this human that's growing inside of you. Yeah, it makes sense. It goes back to the advice of you want to maximize nutrients and minimize toxins. And that should really always be your mindset when it comes to nutrition, especially if you want to have a baby because babies are more sensitive okay. to toxins than adults are. Adults can have a much larger uh, toxic load and not have major symptoms or able to buffer that better than, than a, a developing fetus and then the, the baby once it's born. So we really want to protect them. So like you said, really getting good quality products. And unfortunately, the commercial, you know, the commercial farms, um, you know, where they're grain feeding these animals, they bioaccumulate a lot of toxins. We really have to start with those animal products, which are the most nutrient dense products for our bodies that are going to really support the baby, but we got to make sure that the sourcing is good so we don't get all those toxins and then complement that with all those vegetables. And, you know, with a point there with, with uh, pregnant women, um, or I'm sorry, with uh, vegetarians, definitely I would recommend protein powders as well because they're going to need a lot of protein as, uh, as that baby develops. I mean, the baby, that, that whole structure is protein, right? So we're, you're creating all this protein. We need we need to, to make sure we're getting good, easy to digest protein. You mentioned eggs, dairy products. Sometimes a protein powder can be really helpful for somebody that's you know, not consuming as much animal protein as well. So that can be really helpful there. Um, yeah. And you were also talking about the collagen as well, like doing bone broth. That can also be extremely helpful. You get the calcium that way too. Um, yeah, sardines are great. You can get wild salmon too in the can. Right, and, uh, that has the the bones in there too. So that's a great great approach. Organ meats, right? Which we all love, liver, right? <laughs> <laughs> One thing I like to say. So I'm not a big. I'm yeah. I'm a very picky eater, but I yeah. know that I need what I need. And yeah. so when it comes to organ meats and things like liver, um, even like hearts, um, what I like to do is grind it up. Yeah. or you know, dice it into small to small pieces and add it into so say i'm making like meatloaf i will you know grind up the liver chop it up really small and then mix it into the, the meat mix it into yeah, my yeah. Kind of beef and that way i'm not i don't have to eat it um like by itself but i'm still getting those nutrients um there's also you know supplements so beef liver supplement is going to give you those yeah. same nutrients without you having to consume the animal um, but just making sure that you're getting them into your diet. So making sure that you're getting all of the minerals, all of the vitamins and nutrients that you need overall is really the goal. So however you do it, <laughs> just make sure you get yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So important. And I find that, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, very, very important, especially as that baby's developing. Um, that DHA, that long chain omega-3 DHA, really important for brain development. So that's a great one for pregnancy. Zinc is really important. That's really important for fertility as well. Um, probably the most important nutrient when it comes to, to overall fertility for men and women. Yep. So that's a great one. Um, vitamin D, mm -hmm. so important. In fact, you know, if you're zinc deficient or vitamin D deficient or folate, right, B different B vitamins, B6 and B12 play a role. If you're deficient in those, you have a much greater likelihood of having some sort of congenital 
uh, issue with your baby. So those are all key things to, to look out for. And, you know, getting a good quality multivitamin can, can also be really, really helpful. Um, you know, and so I think that's important to understand. And then how about children? Let's talk about children as they're growing and developing. Um, you know, let's start right from, you know, after birth, right? What, what are some good strategies for helping to take care of uh, a child? Absolutely. So I still, I still believe breast is best. So yeah. the wonderful thing about our bodies and how we're made is that your breast milk changes based on what your baby needs. And so what you'll find is that the consistency changes, the color changes, the nutrient density changes as your baby grows. And so if you can breastfeed, that's absolutely going to be the best thing that you can do for your baby. Um, if you can't, there are some, there are some reasons why women can't breastfeed. And uh, first I would say, make sure you consult a lactation consultant. If you're having issues with breastfeeding, ask someone who, who studies this, this is what they do. Um, but there's also, you have the options of uh, donor breast milk. Um, so that's out there. If you can't get donor breast milk, there are many um, like homemade formulas. So Weston Price has a great homemade formula recipe um, and he's got a dairy, he's got, I think a goat's milk formula. So you can try those. If you can't do that, there's, there's Hip and Holly, which are German made, so they're European. They are very high quality and babies seem to do well on that. So, so first thing is just making sure that they're getting quality nutrition from day one. Um, as far as foods, I typically don't recommend um, introducing foods until we get to about six months when baby can sit up on their own and they start having budding teeth um, because that's going to kind of give you an indication that they're ready to start trying foods. But even at that point, food is just for fun in that first year. So you're just testing out new foods to see what they like, what they don't like. Um, I wouldn't start with sweet so sweet foods, so I wouldn't start immediately with fruits, um, unless you're going avocado, so avocado's a fruit. Um, but that's one Otherwise, of you just get them addicted to sugar. Exactly. That's all they want, they right? Sugar early. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, avocado is probably one of the best foods to introduce to babies early on, um, because it's, it's going to be high in vitamins and nutrients, great full fat, um, and most babies really like it. Um, other things that you can do would be uh, like butternut squash. You could do sweet potatoes, peas, carrots, things like that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, all you're doing, you're introducing them to it so that as they get older, they don't, they're not as picky <laughs> yeah. because now they've, they've encountered some of these vegetables that, you know, a lot of adults probably don't even eat until they get older. Um, but at the same time, you know, they're getting introduced to these nutrients. Be, don't be um, surprised if they don't drink as much while they're eating because typically we don't drink while we eat and they kind of know that innately. And so um, feeding them, giving them milk between solids is probably gonna be the best idea, but just making sure that they're getting everything that they need early on. Um, I'm not big on supplements for babies unless we know specifically that they're deficient. Um, nine times out of 10, if baby's deficient in something or if, if we wanna supplement, we supplement mom and then baby gets it in the breast milk or we supplement um if you're doing formula obviously then you would supplement but there are some really clean clean, clean brands out there um with vitamin d of probiotics um that you can give to baby if there are issues that are starting to show up yeah one thing i found is that like you can you can open a probiotic or you can get like a probiotic powder mm -hmm. for the woman especially if the baby's having like some digestive issues and things like that and just put it on the nipple Yep. So that way, as they're taking that in, although there's there's normal uh, microflora that they're getting right. from the nipple, that they're actually getting more more specific probiotics that can be really helpful. And you know, I always found it interesting that the I mean, I think this is one of the the wonders of the world is that the mother's milk will actually change and adapt based on the nutrient needs of the baby. So if mom's taking care of her health, which yeah. you know is number one, number one thing she can do for her baby is take care of herself then she's gonna have the nutrients that the baby needs and in a very highly absorbable form because mother's milk is extremely absorbable, doesn't take any digestive energy to digest that and it will adapt. So if the baby needs more protein or more vitamin D or more magnesium, the mother's milk itself, it's, you know, it's just this kind of amazing thing that the, the actual taste receptors on the, on the baby, and I think you can probably explain it better than me, will signal to the mother to the mother's body, yeah. exactly the formula that's needed for this child. Exactly, exactly. And it does the same with antibodies. So, you yeah. know, 
if mom is sick or baby is sick, they trade antibodies, they trade information that changes the mother's milk. So sometimes mom will be giving baby antibodies, sometimes baby's mm -hmm. giving mom antibodies. And so it's really cool to see how the bodies interact, um, how you know innately mom and baby are, are connected in, especially, and you see that in the breast milk, you see that in even the adjustment. So I've seen, um, so energy workers who will check mom to find out where baby is lacking as far as you know needing an adjustment or needing um, some type of some type of therapy because they're just so closely innately mm. uh, connected. Um, so yeah, so it's really cool to watch, really cool to see. Yeah, that's awesome. And then also the baby, especially when when they're they're um, drinking breast milk, they're actually signaling oxytocin in the mom, which stimulates a parasympathetic nervous system for the mom and helps her to heal. Yeah. You think the mom obviously is dealing with crying at times, not sleeping great because the baby wakes up, they got to you know, change the diaper and nurse. So that extra oxytocin is really important for the healing process too. So they're working together. You know, it's like a team effort. Absolutely. Absolutely. God, he definitely spared no expense. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's powerful. The human body. It's really amazing. You got it. Now, as children are developing, so let's say, you know, we're, we're through the infant stage, okay, we've, you know, started to introduce these foods. By the way, we introduced bone broth, actually, was, was one of the things that we also did, like a liquid bone broth, which is really good. Um, in fact, our, our daughter still drinks that, which is great. All our kids actually drink bone broth um, because it, it was, they were started early. It's what they knew, right? Yep. avocados, you know, we, we introduce all those kinds of foods that you talked about, all those different vegetables, root vegetables, you know, root vegetables are interesting because, you know, they're great for the microbiome. And you think about it, they're root vegetables, right? And, and really for humans, our roots are our gut, you know, it's our, it's our gut lining, right? And so they're really, really good for supporting the right bacterial diversity because the baby comes out and they really don't have much bacteria in there. And then over time, as they're introducing these foods, they start to really bring in more and more diversity into their microbiome. And those kinds of foods can be really helpful for that. Um, but let's talk about, you know, as the child's now developing, what, what parents can do to really help support their nutrition. So from a nutritional standpoint, you, you want to stay away from processed foods as much mm -hmm. as possible. Um, at any, really at any stage in life, you want to try and eat as close to the source as possible. So yeah. the more processed foods that you're introducing to the kid, it's going to change their palate and they're going to, it's going to be hard to get them to go back to, um, those whole fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to introduce those processed foods too early. And at the same time, we don't want the high sugar content that's in those processed foods. Um, most people don't realize if you're not reading labels, there's sugar in almost everything. And it may, you know, may show up as sucrose or fructose or something else, but there's sugar in, especially in processed foods. Um, and so staying away from those processed foods, getting your kids to eat colorful foods, um, the more colorful, the more colorful the plate is, the more excited they're going to be. They're going to see those colors and they're going to want to experiment the different colors and the different textures and different tastes. Um, and so, you know, staying away from processed foods as much as possible, um, keeping them as close to the source, you know, introducing them to clean meats, you know, full fats, fruits and vegetables, and having them eat, them, they're eating just like you are. So really, there's not, there's not a whole lot of shift there. So if you're eating, you know, good, clean food, your kids should be doing the same. I, I do see that a lot where parents are, okay, I'm going to eat well, I'm going to do right for my body, but then they're still buying, you know, junk food for the kids. Yeah. Um, and so you're, what, everything that you're doing with your kids is preparing them for as they get older. Yeah. And so we see a lot of childhood obesity. We see, you know, we're starting to see diabetes in kids and blood pressure issues in kids and um, behavior issues in kids. So um, not even, not just behavior, but also learning disabilities. So, you know, autism, ADD, ADHD, I see a lot of that in the clinic. Um, and a lot of it stems back to nutrition. So what are they eating? Um, what are they lacking as far as nutrition? If they're not getting it in their diet, making sure that they're taking good, clean supplements. Um, the kids in the office love the chewable. <laughs> they love yeah, your chewable. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it tastes it's great. Well. It's yeah. adults like it too. <laughs> but <laughs> making sure that they are getting everything that they need, if they're not getting it from a whole food source, then make sure they're, they're getting it from a, a whole food supplement source um, because they're going to need all of those supplements. They're going to need all of those nutrients in order to become you know, healthy adults and yeah. to continue that as they get older. Yeah, it's so important. And, and what we have to understand about processed foods is these are hyper palatable foods and they are meant to be addictive. Like the, the food processors are making them in such a way that it's very hard to say no. And as adults, we have a fully formed frontal lobe. So we have better willpower, better ability to say no and kind of, you know, um, although some people struggle with it, we tend to have a better propensity for breaking addictions right. than a child. A child doesn't know any better. They don't know they're addicted to something. And so uh, these sorts of foods are actually rewiring their brain to become addicted to these things. And then obviously they, you know, don't want to eat the healthy foods. And so, because they're so addicted to these things. So the more that we can minimize that, the better, obviously they're going to get exposed to it at some level, you know, at some degree somewhere, but the more that we can keep our house safe, the better, you know, if a child learns that there's processed food, you know, in the, in the corner over here, they're going to be looking for it. Right. I mean, my daughter, she's two years old and my wife, I mean, we have processed foods now. They're healthy. They're, they're the healthier processed foods, right. Um, that you get at whole foods and things like that. But like she, we have to keep the, our pantry door closed because she'll want to go in there and grab something and do her best to open it up and, and eat it, you know, and that's what she'll do. And so um, children, they don't understand addiction. And in fact, they actually want to some degree without knowing it subconsciously, they, they want to be addicted. They want, you know, whatever it is, that's going to make them feel good in the moment. And so we've got to really, you know, play defense on that and make sure that they're eating those nutrient dense foods, the more that they're being surrounded by that, the more satiated they are. And also their microbiome. So our microbiome will end up playing a role in the foods that we're craving. And so the more we're eating processed foods, the more we shift the microbiome and we start getting a lot of, of microbes that are sending out signals for sugar, for sweets, and away from you know, the, the astringent or the, you know, the different flavors of vegetables, um, you know, the kind of sour types of foods and things like that. And so, you know, one way, you know, one thing I found too, Dr. Audrey, is that zinc deficiency is really big in moms and, and actually in children. And sometimes children have really sensitive palates can be a zinc deficiency. Yeah. So that could be something that could really help, um, you know, a little bit of zinc here and there, um, you know, eating more zinc rich foods, which are going to be like your meats, seafood, things like that can be really helpful. Um, you know, omega threes can also be really helpful with that process, like a cod liver oil or something like that. And these days, you know, they make cod liver oil and it's got like a lemon flavor. Yeah. It's like a lemon flavor oil. And so yeah. if you get your kids started on that early, that's got vitamin A, it's got vitamin D, it's got omega-3 fatty acids, really important things for the immune system and for developing, because all that plays a role in the nervous system too, those fat soluble nutrients. And the healthier the nervous system, the 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 better the palate is going to be, right? The more sensitive, like when the when the palate's really, really sensitive and you know that you're just not liking a lot of like a wide variety of foods, then that's a sign that the nervous system is hyperactive, right? And so it's um it's giving too much stimuli and it's off. So chiropractic can help with that, the right nutrients for the nervous system, all of that can help. And then just retraining, right? Coming away from the processed foods, which de which totally desensitize us to uh, the natural flavors that are in real foods and, you know, taking time away from that will reset dopamine receptors. You know, it's one of those big things where, um, you know, we're eating a lot of sugar processed foods. We're burning out our dopamine. It's like somebody that's a cocaine addict, you know, over time, they need more and more and more. Or if you're addicted to anything, you know, whatever it is that you're addicted to, sugar, sex, cocaine, you know, whatever it is, you end up wanting more and more and more. And it still doesn't give you the same, um, the same feeling, the same satisfaction because you're burning out those dopamine receptors. So, you know, withdrawing for a period of time resets those dopamine receptors. So important for the kids, even if they're giving you a hard time about it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, even if you're, if you're at that point where you've got kids that, you know, they, you know, they just won't eat because they, you won't give them what they want. It's okay. <laughs> like they yeah. will be fine. Kids, they're as, as stubborn as they can be sometimes. 
when they're hungry, they will yeah. eat. No, um, nobody's intentionally starved themselves to death. Exactly. They got food in the fridge, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah. And that, I mean, yeah, it's going to be, it might be a little frustrating if you're, you know, if you're already past that point, but there is, there's a way back. There's a way back and your kids will be better for it. Um, not just at home, but even at school when it comes to learning and things like that. And that's what you want. You want to set them up for the best possible life um, mm -hmm. as they get older. And what would you advise? Let's say somebody's listening and they've got a child that's, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. They, you know, they only want to eat macaroni and cheese or whatever it is. Well, where would you start with that? So I would start with um, trying to incorporate more of the good, healthy foods into what they're already eating. Um, mm -hmm. So I was good for, so Brandon, you know, he lived with me for yeah. twice a month. Yeah. I was really good for hiding <laughs> fruits and vegetables into what he yeah. was already eating. And then slowly increasing those quantities and to the point where I could just say, okay, well, we're not going to have this today. We're going to have this and um, getting him to the point where he's like, okay, I'll do this, I'll do this today. And then it's like, okay, well, we made it through today, so let's do tomorrow. And so taking it one day at a time, introducing those, those good foods, even if you have to hide them. Um, kids do really great with smoothies. Smoothies are a great way to hide nutrients. Um, and so, you know, you, you make them a good, clean smoothie. Kids really like the uh, multi-collagen is what I, one thing yeah. I'm coming with on. Um, it's not quite as heavy as some of the other protein powders. And so, you know, getting the, the good multi-collagen, adding in some berries and some vegetables, and you can throw some, some vitamins in there as well if you need yeah. to. Um, just getting it into their system. Obviously, you're going to cut back on what you're buying. So if they don't see it, then it's less likely that they'll want it as much. And so if you don't bring it into the house, they can't get it. They don't have any other way of getting it. And so just being conscious of what you're allowing them to put into the grocery cart, what you're bringing home um, is going to be really important. And like you said, there are healthier options, healthier processed food options. And so trading those out for the more conventional things are definitely going to be a good idea. Um, and, and one day at a time, you'll get there. <laughs> yeah. And you have that hands-on experience because Brandon is your nephew, correct? And you took him in, he lived with you for a period of time. And yeah. how old was he when he started living with you? Brandon was about six when he came to live with me. And obviously he had been raised up to that point on, you know, the, the standard American diet. Um, so he started out on formula, lots of processed foods, uh, very, very picky eater. And slowly, you know, I, I was eating healthy. I was in chiropractic school, so I was ingrained in the life bubble. So I knew what healthy eating was. And so that's what I was doing at home. And, you know, he fought me a little bit when he, when he first got there. Um, but slowly, like I said, we just started hiding foods into his, hiding good, healthy foods into what he was already eating. Um, I didn't buy processed foods. I didn't buy juice. I didn't buy junk food. And so it got to a point where he was just like, okay, well, I got to eat something. <laughs> so he started eating. Um, he would go to class with me and, you know, everybody in my classroom, they're eating carrots and they're eating celery. And so of course, you know, he's, he's eating what they're eating because they're giving it to him. And so um, it was, a, I'd say probably within maybe a year or so. Um, he was, uh, he was eating completely healthy and he would even tell, you know, adults when we would go to church or when we'd be out, he's like, oh, you shouldn't eat that. That's not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's this little kid, cause he was a little guy, um, telling people, telling adults how, what they should and shouldn't eat. And so, um, kids pick up on things. They, they grow and they learn and, you know, it may be hard at first, but like you said, they will not starve. They will eat, they'll find something that they like. And so when you find that something, okay, give them that something and start to add in new things. So. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really great advice with this. Absolutely. Well, you know, this has been a really, really great interview, Dr. Audrey, and I'd love for you to share, you know, just final words of inspiration for our listeners. And also, where can they find out more about you and follow you on social media? So I am on social media is Dr. Adriana B. So D-R dot A-D-R-I-A-N-A-B. And that's my Instagram handle. You can also find me there on Facebook as well. Um, obviously, if you're not following the Exodus Health Center page, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, um, and you'll find lots of information on, you know, health in general. But if you have specific questions um, as far as preconception, prenatal, postpartum, or even kids, um, feel free to shoot me an email. So my email is aubedford, A-U-B-E-D, F-O-R-D at gmail.com. 
and I'm more than welcome, more than happy to answer any questions you may have, uh, whether it be birth questions. Um, I can give you links to find a chiropractor in your area if you're not in Georgia. Um, we can find you an ICPA chiropractor um, and just get you on the right track. So there are plenty of resources out there that will help you get to your health goals for you and your family. And um, I'm more than happy to share. Well, fantastic. So those of you guys are out there that are looking to have a healthy pregnancy uh, or raise healthy children, Dr. Audrey is definitely a great person to follow. So check her out if you're in the Cobb County, Kennesaw, North Atlanta area. Definitely check out Exodus Health Center. That is my former clinic that I actually started that Dr. Audrey is running and uh, taking great care of all the folks there. So if you're in there, check out Exodus Health Center and follow Dr. Audrey for, for, uh, for more advice and uh, follow her career as, uh, as she gets going here and, and um, is serving people all around the world. So guys, with that said, be blessed and we'll see you guys on a future podcast.